Oh, Reggie told me. You've gotten terrific since you left him. He said that? I was reading through the comments from a previous video about Slapshot, and one of the viewers included an observation that was eye-catching at a minimum. In this viewer's estimation, Slapshot was, quote, a covertly nasty feminist flick, unquote, which builds up women at the expense of men. I found this interpretation original and, well, unexpected, first because something put up so nakedly on the screen could not really be said to be covert exactly, and second because feminism, to me anyway, is really about equality more than anything else, equal pay and so forth. Still, I found this an intriguing way of looking at the film, which was produced by men, helmed by an incredibly experienced, accomplished, and thoughtful Hollywood director, George Roy Hill, and starring one of the most recognizable and manly American actors of his generation, who had played many different sportsmen over the years, Paul Newman. Such embedded themes and their larger meaning probably wouldn't have escaped these men or their people at least. Plus, if this gender-based interpretation was correct on some ostensible level, insofar as the women by and large end up in a better place than the men, then the film risked alienating the very audience that Nancy Dowd was seeking and eventually did attract, since they were the people who might never have been receptive, much less sympathetic, to this more gender-based approach to filmmaking. To say the least, it seems unlikely that back in 1977, much of the paying audience for Slapshot were women's studies majors. To be sure, the script is very skillfully assembled, as we would expect of such a gifted writer. I should probably answer this criticism right here. The strange notion that a comedy cannot be as valuable as a traditional drama in terms of discussing interesting things and raising fascinating issues. To me, this hierarchical distinction is largely without merit. That is, there is no such thing as a film being just a comedy. Making things funny is probably much harder, though a comedy still has to create its own believable world for the characters to inhabit. Depending on the director, writers, and actors, a comedy can be significant at a minimum, and this is true of any George Roy Hill or Paul Newman or Nancy Dowd film. Put them all together and you get something pretty special, a fascinating mashup of high concepts and vulgarity that somehow manages to capture every significant aspect of the world of minor pro hockey. It is also true that not everyone, either then or now, sees the world as subdivided by gender alone rather than by other things that are also significant, like religion, income, political affiliation, nationality, or culture. So it would probably be more accurate to say that Slapshot has built into it a rather fascinating and unexpected subtext, which sees women as long-suffering and undervalued members of society, who have to indulge men more than anything else, and who sometimes in relationships get the short end of the stick, and often have to tolerate men acting like children. Consider... When Reggie calls Ned Braden out for refusing to fight, the Princeton-educated Braden, who is put forward as the calm, enlightened, nearly Ken Dryden-esque intellect on the Chiefs, can only plottingly and obtusely reply in the literal. You want ice time, you come and tell me when you want to play it my way. The biggest fucking pussy in the league. That's right! I like pussy! Yeah. It is very odd for a married adult male to want to or perhaps need to declare this out loud in front of Charlestown fans and his Chiefs teammates. Anyway, for the one and only time in Slapshot when sexuality did not play into things, Braden seems determined to throw it back into the mix, call it bringing back not the sexy, but the sexist. Naturally, Reggie has little choice but to point out Braden's failing marriage. Well, that's not what I hear from your wife. I hear... Two men that we might expect would know better act like squabbling children in front of the fans. There is something quintessentially male about this scene. A man determined to remain a pacifist bystander suckers a teammate in order to show, dysfunctionally expressed as it surely is, how much he loves his spouse, whom he has been cheating on. So one could argue that he is attempting to demonstrate fealty to Lily through animosity toward Reggie. It is a paradigm of dysfunctionality. One has to take their hat off to Ms. Dowd and say touché especially because Braden presents himself as cooler and more aware than everyone else, yet his first ever foray into hockey violence is against a teammate in his 50s. This is just the beginning. Braden then follows this up by invading the press box, publicly confessing to Jim Carr that he is having trouble at home, in the bedroom, before outing the radio broadcaster as follically challenged, arguably the worst-kept secret in Charlestown. Go on, Paul! 
old, Jim. Can't you face up to that? Well, at least I'm not chicken shit like you! After this, he gets into a brief but memorable tussle with Joe McGrath, Strother Martin. Of course, and for the record, Reggie is absolutely right to castigate Braden for being a lousy husband. Infidelity in a small community is never a bright move. Though Reggie seems impressed that Braden could level him with a single punch, Braden's taking a poke at Reggie nevertheless seems like the physical embodiment of what has sometimes been called toxic masculinity. The thought occurs that people the world over saw a similar incident play out before them, when Will Smith slapped Chris Rock during the broadcast of the 94th Academy Awards ceremony, ostensibly for making a rather milquetoast G.I. Jane joke about Jada Pinkett Smith, Mr. Smith's spouse. Somehow, as in Slapshot, it's always unsettling to see colleagues unable to get along together. It is certainly true that upon an initial perusal of Slapshot, the empowerment of women does not immediately jump out as the primary theme of the film. Nevertheless, it's in there somewhere, mixed in with other things. It should come as no surprise that a writer of Nancy Dowd's sophistication was interested in writing a script that moved beyond just satirizing hockey violence or closely examining the nature of the sport at a minor league level. It's all part of a larger conversation. There is a certain genius at work. It's ahead of its time in some ways, and most reviewers didn't catch the subtext. Not so much because they're deluded or sexist or just obtuse, but because there's a lot of other stuff which attracts the viewer's attention, especially what was then perceived and still is as a particularly foul-mouthed script, though in truth it's probably just how people spoke then and probably now as well, depending on the company you keep. The real question to me is how Nancy Dowd worked all of this into her screenplay so effortlessly. For starters, the script is pure verisimilitude, especially of language, but there is also the structure of the film, how it unfolds, as well as the distinctive characters and their relationships to each other. Different aspects of the script are there for different reasons. Naturally, the vulgarity and obscenities fulfill every writer's purpose, delivering some kind of basic truth, who the minor leaguers were but it also serves the purpose of distracting the viewer. At a certain point, the vulgarity can become all you notice, so you may miss some of the other things that are occurring. I read an interesting review of Slapshot by a younger individual on a hockey website. The writer is articulate and grudgingly, almost apologetically, conceded that Slapshot remains entertaining in a raunchy kind of way. But what struck me was that the reviewer conceived Reggie Dunlop as essentially the antagonist of the film, labeling him skeevy, a jerk, a dickhead, and a douchebag. I always found the Reggie Dunlop character entertaining and fun, so I guess time alters context, and people today perceive Reggie as a manipulator, an opportunist, and a liar, the darkest imaginable interpretation of his character. About the only thing that hasn't changed much is people's shock at the jarring language and it is an achievement to still stun people with a movie released decades before. There aren't too many films that can say this. Dowd's script is unique in other ways. Designed to work on multiple levels, it is reminiscent of a children's story, which, because it can be read in different ways, may also entertain adults. Dowd knew that Slapshot had to be light-hearted and fun, but she had surprises, like the Hansons, three ordinary young men who turn out to be serious fighters. A great movie script, which stands the test of time, tends to be about more than one thing. So there's the basic narrative in Slapshot, a team fighting for survival as a metaphor for the faltering economy, as well as clearly defined themes about violence and teamwork and the business of professional hockey. Then there are subtexts, things that are typically much less obvious. Often implicit or contextual, they are the underlying meaning of the work. The key here is that the women in the film are present but never focused on for very long. They are not protagonists in any ordinary sense. We just see flashes of Lily Braden, Lindsay Krauss, and flashes of Francine Dunlop, Jennifer Warren. They are either in the background, so to speak, or not on screen at all. They tend to be dutiful, long-suffering, and much too tolerant. They are not major characters, but they remain players in the story regardless. In so doing, Dowd challenges the traditional trope of the better half. Here, the women are largely at their wit's end, pushed about as far as they're likely to be pushed. You can split the difference in a sense. The women are human, and deeply flawed, and sometimes cliches, as are the men. They're all gentle caricatures. 
But the male characters, like Joe McGrath, Ned Braden, and Reggie Dunlop, are shown in extreme close-up, so to speak. Everything about them, good or bad, mostly bad in the comedic sense, since they seem stubborn, arrogant, and obtuse, is magnified. The women come off as less deeply flawed and irrational because their hypocrisies and foibles and idiosyncrasies are not exposed to the same degree, if at all. Their absence from the vast majority of the picture cannot help but make them appear as though they have their lives together. Just for starters, they clearly have better places to be than watching a Charlestown Chiefs game. In the end, I'm not entirely sure that Dowd actually started out with a specific agenda to portray women in a particular way. Perhaps it just worked out this way, but the case to be made after watching the film is so strong that somehow it's hard not to make it. The plot and the interplay between characters feels so naturally occurring, so familiar to people in long-duration relationships, the ups and downs and petty arguments and infidelities and disappointments and recurring patterns of unselfish and selfish behavior, that Dowd's script does not feel as much like a parody as it does, according to one viewer, a documentary. I believe the viewer felt that about the general topic hockey is played at that moment in history, but Slapshot is much more than this alone. It's about how people were beginning to live their lives then, in the 1970s, and the sea change in relations between men and women. The profanity, which came directly from recorded conversations in the Johnstown Jets locker room, acts as a bizarre kind of insulation. It so distracts critics and viewers that Nancy Dowd could have her characters say nearly anything, and people would still be distracted by the more overt things occurring on screen. Things like Suzanne Hanrahan's, Melinda Dillon's memorable anatomy, Tim McCracken's unusual greeting for his old pal, Reggie. Hey, McCracken! Dunlop, you suck cock! The organist, Rod Masters, getting clocked in the head by an errant slap shot. Steve Hansen's memorable admonition against conversing during the Star Spangled Banner. I run a clean game here. I have any trouble, I'll suspend you. I'm listening to a fucking song! And this self same anthem before the championship game played at astonishingly high speed for no discernible reason. Dowd's script is so vivid and evocative and powerful that she can do extraordinary things. Why not a loving look at the minor leagues while simultaneously presenting something about hockey wives and gender roles? Could two characters ever differ more than a self-starter like Francine Dunlop, who wants nothing to do with hockey life? God, it's been a long time since this place saw my shadow. And Shirley Upton? Swoozy Kurtz, who lives through her husband, Johnny. Johnny doesn't care for the fighting. He told me so. The script is ambivalent in many ways, often displaying opposites for us to consider. For example, at times it demonstrates disdain for violence and how ugly the game can get at its absolute worst, and yet it glories in showing how compelling and exciting the game can sometimes be at its uplifting best. Ms. Dowd wants to expose us to the players and reveal more about their lives and loves, but she does not pull too many punches. We see all the players as flawed and vulnerable. Throughout the film, men are habitually shown as making foolish choices and behaving rashly. Their flaws are so glaring and their conduct so erratic that they serve as a kind of comic relief. This even extends to minor characters. Brophy, John Gofton for example, appears early on and attempts to play while inebriated. Anybody throws me against the boards, I'm gonna piss all over myself. Oglethorpe, Ned Dowd, a dangerous Neanderthal under suspension by the league. He is a criminal element. The worst goon in hockey today. Oh yeah, real cement head. Yeah, big afro, 21, 22, watch out. For Hanrahan, Christopher Murney, a diminutive player with anger issues. When Hanrahan found out about it, he went crazy. He, he said if I was a dyke, that made him a queer. And McCracken, Paul D'Amato, little more than an assassin on skates. McCracken, also known as Dr. Hook, for his scalpel-like prowess with the stick, has been known to carve a man's eye out with the flick of the wrist. On the team, Johnny Upton, Alan Nichols, the chief's captain, exposes himself at a fashion show as a way of showing how little he respects the wishes of general manager Joe McGrath. Dave Killer Carlson, Jerry Hauser, is basically a flesh-and-blood punching bag for opponents. And Maurice Mo Wanchuk, Brad Sullivan, is surely one of the creepiest oversexed characters in the history of film. Well, here's to the Sunshine State! Right, yeah. Here's to all that gorgeous snatch in FLA. Hey, Reggie! 
Madge, I want a chair by the pool. I want some snatch by the pool. The men tend to be engaged in feckless activities, and the complexity of the macho culture surrounding hockey, and fighting in particular, is presented in nearly fetishistic terms. <laughs> what are you guys doing? Putting on the foil. Every game. Yeah, you want some? The men tend to be childish and braggadocious. Braden, for example, argues that the team succeeds because of his scoring prowess. We win because I score goals! Oh, kiss my ass! We win because I make them crazy! For the record, neither Ned's goals nor Reggie's transformation of Chiefs games into chaotic spectacles can save the team from its ultimate fate. That age-old idea of giving the audience what it wants most, bread and circuses, superficial appeasement, makes no difference. The men in Slapshot have no agency. It's just people moving around deck chairs on the Titanic, wasting their time and their lives, and deluding themselves that they have any control. Dave is not a killer, and never will be. Johnny Upton is doubtlessly headed back to the Chrysler factory one way or the other. <laughs> Fucking Chrysler plant, here I come! And Mo Wanchuk probably has several tense and ultimately fruitless visits with human resources in his future. We don't know about McGrath, and he does do a pretty good job assembling a team for Reggie to whip into shape, but he is still very much yesterday's man. His tedious, irrelevant anecdotes about Eddie Shore probably won't land him the job he seeks. Sergeant, I knew Eddie Shore. You guys back told there. Mike and oh, the Rock Peterborough lost. Parody mixed with documentary produces something truly remarkable. The script sends up the bravado-filled, male-dominated locker room of the 1970s, but it does so as a kind of homage to the sport. So Dowd subsumes the support of those she is parodying. She accurately captures pretty much every aspect of the game in a nearly microscopic examination, but it is with a purpose. To be sure, it absolutely does not make an inherent case that men like Reggie Dunlop, and McGrath, and Dickie Dunn, and Emmett Walsh, and Jim Carr, Andrew Duncan, and Ned Braden, Michael Onkin, are expending their lives judiciously. It portrays everything connected to hockey as farcical. Much of the action in Slapshot is in fact fruitless. That is, it leads nowhere. So own the Chiefs. Owns. 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 The basic plot is that Reggie invents a fictional buyer to stimulate the interest of an actual buyer, which of course never occurs. Yeah. Dickie Dunn wrote this. Yeah. It's gotta be true. Yeah. Times Herald that a St. Petersburg, Florida retirement community is negotiating with the Charlestown Hockey Corporation for the purchase of the Charlestown. After he starts this rumor, nearly the entire team falls in behind Reggie's project, working to create a winning attitude, which might convince the fictional buyer that the Chiefs are worth every penny of their fictional money. Even, and perhaps especially the media, also fall into line, with Dickie Dunn printing a series of total fictions about ownership's negotiation with the Florida buyer and Jim Carr interviewing Reggie about the reputedly difficult, non-existent negotiations. It's all game-playing and brinksmanship on some level. The entire plan, such as it is, amounts to a childish wish that Reggie can ultimately control events, perhaps even the events of his own life, especially his aging out of hockey. It is easier to disappear into his fantasy life than to actually face reality. Many of Reggie's teammates are similarly conflicted coming to terms with having little or no education and no definitive plan for the future. For athletes in particular, getting old is hard since they have inherently more to lose than others. The childishness of all this is hard to miss. The primary motivation of most of the main characters is insecurity with everyone questioning everyone else's masculinity and virility. God, maybe Braden's a faggot. Did you ever think of that? You crazy? He has a big cock, like a horse. There are typically rivalries among the players themselves. This is sometimes referred to as hegemonic masculinity, male hierarchies within male hierarchies. Anybody call my old lady a dyke like a fucking banana? His wife is a dyke. Does that make him a fag? Fuck him. On the Chiefs, Braden is convinced that his natural talent is what keeps the team winning, but Reggie is equally sure that the team's aggressive tactics are what brings the fans back. It's a little like those old Miller Lite commercials, taste great, less filling, except in this case it really makes no difference. Ultimately, the team is going out of business, and nothing can really change this, so the die is cast before most of the film that we see unfolds on the screen. It is all a rather pointless exercise, and the arguments may not be mutually exclusive. They may win because of Braden and sell out the war memorial because of Reggie, but one way or the other, 
The team is folding and not relocating and thus ceasing to exist entirely because of a woman who only appears once in the film who is not a fan of the sport and who postulates that hockey violence might just be the root of all evil because of imitative behavior. I have to confess that I've never let the children watch a hockey game. Again, men like McGrath and Reggie and the media men are revealed to be without power. They cannot change or enhance or save anything. The battle for the team's existence is over long before Reggie becomes involved. And remember, initially, he was studiously disinterested in who was making the decisions. Who owns a club anyway? Uh, I don't know. You don't know? What do you mean? A corporation owns it. Most of the film is just boys being boys, fumbling around and hoping things change, but no one has any real power to do much. There is no real plan. The correct term for this situation is impotence, and Slapshot seems replete with examples of it. The men and their petty menstruations do not end up making a difference once Anita makes up her mind to move on. To put it bluntly, the movie is populated with limp dicks, whose best days are long behind them. McGrath, Jim Carr, Dickie Dunn give off a kind of arthritic old age home vibe, irrelevant perhaps even to themselves. Even Reggie, despite being cool and funny, is old for a player, so he's seen better days and is having trouble keeping up with the kids. It should be pointed out, however, that being old is no inoculation against childishness in Slapshot. Somebody cut off play. my box! I'll be skating in Florida! which seems to have infected every man in Charlestown, and perhaps every boy as well. You know, I was uh, watching some kids play hockey the other day, five and six-year-olds. One of those little kids said, I'm Killer Carlson. He picked up his little stick and he just creamed that other little kid. How do you feel Even about Braden is not immune. He may be younger and more virile than the others, as well as Ivy League educated, but he is no less a caricature. Like the proverbial Pavlovian dog, he comes running back to his wife Lily once Francine gives her a makeover, perhaps Hollywood's most enduring and unrealistic trope. Moreover, Braden's impromptu striptease during the championship game, a reversal of the usual form of objectification, seems designed to please Lily insofar as it floats all the traditions of hockey. And let's be clear. Lily appears to despise hockey only slightly less than she despises living in Charlestown. Braden's striptease has little to do with much beyond a certain contempt for enforcers like McCracken, who seems to take hockey violence so seriously that he punches the referee in the back of the head for permitting this, that is Braden's odd performance, to continue without sanction. You'd think it'd be a minor for a delay of game or something. Since Charlestown wins the championship, it seems as though the battle of the irrelevant arguments, scoring goals versus making the fans crazy, is ultimately won by Reggie since stripping probably falls closer to making people crazy than scoring goals does. So congratulations to Reggie, though the franchise still folds and nothing he did really mattered very much one way or the other, except there were many more fans present to see Braden's butt, so it wasn't a total write-off. In this and other scenes in Slapshot, Braden behaves as an impetuous child, which kind of completes the circle. Everything about hockey is represented as a kind of frivolity, including the championship game, which Braden turns into a mockery, protesting hockey violence while disrobing and figure skating around to David Rose's 1962 song, The Stripper. Throughout Slapshot, women tend to be the only characters presented as responsible adult figures. For example, of all the women in the film, only the Sparkle Twins, Janet and Louise Arters, regularly attend games. Suzanne Hanrahan sort of sums up everyone's feelings nicely when Reggie mentions that the Chiefs are scheduled to meet the Ducks, her husband's team. God, I'm so sick of those games. They seem so childish. Make no mistake, Nancy Dowd may be a hockey fan, but she stops short of being an apologist. She sees the sport for what it is, not how others, insiders like Reggie and McGrath, for example, would tend to romanticize it. She is sending up professional sports, of that there is no doubt. Yet she does it with such accuracy and kindness and fairness that it comes off more as a love letter to the sport and the teams and the players. Nancy Dowd's interweaving of her brother Ned's experiences into the script allows her to generate credibility and establish command of the topic. Her script is a unique blending of truth about the players' lives, facts about how the game was played then, and humor making light of otherwise problematical material. The script somehow made unabashed admirers 
out of potentially vociferous critics. This was surprising since, as often as not, Slapshot actually drags the sport through the mud. For example, bounties on the heads of opponents. A, a bounty? Yeah. A hundred bucks of my own money for the first of my men that really nails that creep. Extreme violence bordering on assault as a means of generating revenue. Casual homophobia and sexism in the locker room. I told him his wife was a dyke. No! Yeah! <laughs> Fuck. Turning a blind eye to domestic abuse. When Hanrahan found out about it, he went crazy. And he started slapping me around. I ended up in the hospital. A press corps of largely unabashed cheerleaders and unresponsive ownership that cares not one whit about the fans. People go nuts for us. You could find a buyer. I don't think you understand finance. It is a testament to the actual game that it has survived so much over the years and continues to thrive. Things like the Philadelphia Flyers and Hartford Whalers' flirtation with Cooperalls in the early 1980s. Three-on-three -three hockey, if the game is tied after regulation time, which still doesn't feel too much like hockey. Shootouts if the three-on-three -three fails to decide the game, which was added for the 2005-2006 season, and which resembles tossing a coin to determine the winner. And an entire season lost in 2004-2005, the lockout. Also, hockey as a sport continues to overcome questionable alternate jerseys, such as the Kingston Frontenac's Don Cherry tribute jersey from 2009, the so-called Grapes jersey. In a sense, the women in Slapshot see sports in a certain way, and they share little, if anything, in common with how the male characters conceive the world. The men are obsessed with competition and winning and excelling, whereas the women see hockey as a juvenile pastime, something more suited to children than adults. It seems fitting that the theme song of the film is right back where we started from, perhaps the ultimate description of something that never evolves or progresses forward, but merely leaves you where you came in. Ms. Nightingale's international hit single undoubtedly reflects quite accurately how women in the movie collectively conceive professional sports. There's always another home game, or another road game, or another playoff game, or another all-star game, and then it all starts over again the next season. This feeling of futility, ending right back where you started from, is not a healthy direction for any relationship. In such a situation, there cannot help being a dawning realization that things could be better. This was a big part of how society was changing at that moment. The 1950s were so different from what came later, in the 70s especially, people being much less willing to put up with a lifetime of the same problems and patterns and behaviors and arguments. Francine might have toughed it out in the years before, but by the mid-1970s, there's no reason in the world for her to do this anymore. Self-help, psychotherapy, and couples counseling were emerging, though Reggie doesn't appear an ideal candidate for any of that. Nevertheless, what becomes apparent in Slapshot is that women have gained a kind of veto power over relationships. It is a change of attitude more than anything official. Anita McCambridge disapproves of hockey because she thinks children imitate what they see. Her utter naivete is not the point. She as good as cancels the Chiefs, just as Lily cancels Braden, at least for a while, and Suzanne cancels her marriage to Hanrahan, and Francine cancels Reggie pretty hard. Frankly, She's just not that into him anymore. Slapshot is more about the healing of broken hearts than anything else. Reggie cannot bear to contemplate the end of the Chiefs any more than he can bear to contemplate the end of his marriage. He lives inside a series of childish delusions. As viewers, we find Reggie perfectly charming and charismatic, but we do not have to stay married to him and live alongside him. For Francine, it is his character that is the problem, and it wears on her. She realizes that she will always be engaged in a kind of tug-of-war against the game for the privilege of being first in Reggie's thoughts, if not his heart. She needs to do something to extricate herself from this unproductive cycle. This was kind of what the 1970s were about, making yourself happy. The so-called me decade, as the American writer Tom Wolfe put it. Though Reggie is always solicitous towards Francine, she neither wants nor needs Reggie's attention. Ah, oh, Francie, you look terrific. You're right. <laughs> Contrast Reggie's attempt to be civil with the kind of things that Francine says to Reggie. Huh. You're a losing coach. You can't make him win. Did you listen to the game last night? Of course not. We got a whole new attitude. It's bringing us a lot of success. Well, any fool can fight. No, I swear to you. She makes no secret of the fact that she has moved on. 
What she is seeking, in our terms, is a conscious uncoupling from Reggie. She considers all the time and energy he expended hoping to save the Chiefs as wasteful and silly, much as she perceives professional sports in general, not a suitable pursuit for an adult male. Francine goes off on her own to Long Island and clearly feels sorry for Reggie, a little. Again, she sees herself as the adult in the relationship, while Reggie behaves a little like a love-struck high school student, always concerned about the men Francine might have been taking up with. Son of a bitch. Francine is aware of this and spends much of the film slowly and thus humanely attempting to leave Reggie's orbit, and she ultimately does, curiously, at the moment of his greatest triumph, after winning the Federal League Championship. Lily Braden is similarly unimpressed with Reggie. You really married a weirdo. He don't run with the traffic. Speaking of weirdos... Me? I'm normal. Yeah, well, the normal is fucked. She does not get him exactly and merely tolerates his silliness. Again, she seems a little more like an adult than Reggie does, though less so than Francine. Even in her own marriage to Braden, Lily seems to have been the glue holding things together. I underlined the fuck scenes for you. Only after she briefly moves in with Reggie, which serves as a shot across the bow of her marriage, only then does Braden realize how much he would miss Lily's love if she were to leave Charlestown without him. Ironically, what Lily seeks, a traditional marriage, is what Francine is eschewing with Reggie. Francine is a different kind of person than Lily and wishes to move on to a new life elsewhere, and this necessarily does not include Reggie Dunlop. She even makes a case for divorce, I'm only halfway out the revolving door, you know what I mean? Oh, it's lousy at first. You think you're dying, but then it's fabulous. I mean, you become a new woman. In Slapshot, most of the women we meet are independent and honest in their own way, and they seem perfectly happy living their lives outside of traditional monogamous relationships. The women are almost all sexually liberated, open and free, unafraid to be themselves. For example, Lily flexes her muscles by leaving Braden and then reuniting with him after his striptease, which, in any event, was kind of his version of an apology to her. A personal gift to Lily, who is ambivalent about hockey and Charlestown. It's Braden's way of acknowledging that her needs were not being met. Suzanne Hanrahan, on the other hand, was so bored with her life that she felt free to begin experimenting with other kinds of relationships. I guess what I'm trying to say is that the women in the film seem better off on account of their sexual openness. Lily, Francine, Suzanne Hanrahan, and even the Sparkle Twins all have a degree of agency and they do what makes them happiest. They don't much seem to care what others think. In this way, the women seem infinitely more enlightened than the men. Consider the case of the Hanrahans. While Suzanne is so naturally curious about human sexuality that she inquires whether Reggie has ever been tempted to have sex with men, her husband Tommy sees the world quite differently. He is so threatened by his wife's emerging interest in women that he traces it back to his own lack of prowess between the sheets and assaults her. And I ended up in the hospital. Oh, Jesus. Yeah, I'm on the lam. I'm hiding out. The women in Slapshot are invariably attractive, spirited, and witty. Call it sort of Sarah Silverman-esque. Some are kind of vaguely heterosexual in the sense that they literally enjoy having sex with men, but do not like men for much else. In fairness, in Charlestown anyway, judging by the men we meet, there may not be that much to like. Nancy Dow deliberately includes a particularly blatant example of a traditional 1950s passive, dutiful hockey wife, Shirley Upton, and it's kind of disturbing. Throughout the film, Shirley says little that is not directly related to things that her husband, Johnny Upton, either says or believes. She lives through Johnny and kind of worships him. This is ironic because Upton, in turn, lives through and kind of worships Ned Braden. It is vaguely reminiscent of the relationship between Troy Barlow, Mark Wahlberg, and Conrad Vig, Spike Jones, in the 1999 film Three Kings. Rather than being given a brief one-line description of his life like the other characters, Vig is described only as wanting to be Troy Barlow. The implication is that he has no real life outside the army. Anyway, Upton admires Ned's education. Jesus Christ, look at Ned here. He doesn't have to depend on hockey. Looks to Ned for leadership and laughs way too uproariously at Ned's jokes, as when Ned inquires if the Hansons are related. 
Are you guys brothers? Are you guys brothers? <laughs> Beyond whipping it out at the fashion show. I'm going to wiggle it out of you, cheap bastard. I'm telling you, you better be prepared because when I yank it out, everybody in that audience, with the exception of my wife, is going to be running for the exits. And later speaking the truth about Dave Killer Carlson. Dave was there. Dave's a killer! Yeah! yeah. yeah. Dave's a killer. Dave's a mess. Yeah. Yeah. Upton is entirely unremarkable, yet surely reveres him as though his words are prescient rather than just idle chit chat. Yeah. Johnny always says you can just screw so much and drink so much. In some ways, Shirley Upton is perhaps the most recognizable character in the film. We all know someone like her who admires their spouse in an entirely unrealistic, unproductive and frankly unconvincing way. The script seems to be daring us to imagine how bereft of meaning our own lives would be if someone like Johnny Upton were somehow the gatekeeper of our worldview. The implication seems to be that Shirley would be much better off asking someone like Francine for guidance and probably jumping ship in favor of a more balanced relationship or failing that at least a partner worthy of deification. Have you seen hey, Dunlap or Brady? I'm going to flash him, Joe. Oh, no, I'm going to walk Please, down that sir. stinking aisle. I'm going to open this faggot bathrobe and wiggle my dick out. This really was the only significant thing he does in the film. Through the majority of Slapshot, the owner of the team remains a total mystery. Yet near the end, after Reggie blackmails McGrath into giving him the address... Rich, remember how, uh, how I screamed at you when you started coming on to me? And I just said, Jesus, stop it, Joe. I'm ashamed of you. Damn you. Reggie drives over unannounced to meet with Anita McCambridge to see what she plans to do. Even at this point, Reggie still believes that it must be her husband, not her, who owns the Charlestown Chiefs. Where's your husband? He's in puppy heaven. This part of the script already subverts our view of the world because we are conditioned to see the owners of sports franchises as men, typically white men. And this continues to be true today as well. Anita was more than Reggie had bargained for, since unlike most owners, she is not at all motivated by ego. The Chiefs mean less than nothing to her, so things like championships wouldn't turn her head. She feels no affection for any of the players or Reggie, so again, loyalty is a non-starter. It is possible that she likes McGrath, since they talk on the telephone and he effectuates her wishes without protest, fashion shows and so forth, but he is only one man. Anita appears entirely devoid of sentimentality. This might be admired or anticipated in a businessman, say the chairman of Exxon Mobil, but it is not something Reggie expects from Anita. To him, it is inconceivable that she places no value on a winning team. More than anything, Anita is an adult, making adult decisions involving huge investments. She is only interested in what's most viable in an economic sense, and since the sale is precluded for tax reasons, say the accountants, she abandons the idea of selling the team as a going concern. It is more economically advantageous to fold the team, so she folds it. This scene is all about who controls the purse strings. Anita possesses real, actual, tangible power. It's not about scoring goals or putting bounties on opposition enforcers' heads or selling a few more tickets, or spinning another tale for the benefit of Jim Carr's listeners, or Dickie Dunn's loyal readers. Anita wields the power of economic life and death, and whether she knows it or not, when she ends the Charlestown Chiefs permanently, it is a symbolic act of revenge for all hockey widows the world over. Anita probably could have gotten away with employing the old axiom, it's not personal, it's just business, but she can't leave it at that and pushes on. She starts expounding a kind of personal domino theory, except less convincing than the original, and not really hers in any event, but rather what the pop culture was postulating at that moment, that television was so powerful and viewers so inclined to imitate things on TV in their personal lives that any kind of televised violence would tend to pollute and contaminate society. Hockey at that moment was a convenient scapegoat, Getting into all this with Reggie is obviously unnecessary, but Anita clearly wants to show him who's boss. I have to confess that I've never let the children watch a hockey game. I have a theory that children imitate what they see. If they see violence, they'll become violent. Even at this point in Slapshot, Anita seems like an adult, albeit an arrogant, obnoxious, and opinionated one, whereas Reggie's reaction to the failure of his plan to get the team sold 
which was fanciful and unlikely to succeed in any event, is a particularly creepy, hurtful, juvenile tantrum. You know, your son looks like a fag to me. You better get married again, because he's going to wind up with somebody's cock in his mouth before he can say Jack Robinson. How dare you! While Reggie's ad hominem attack is satisfying to the viewer, who instinctively hopes for the chief's survival, and that's why Nancy Dowd includes it, it is probably something that wouldn't have occurred if the chief's owner had turned out to be a man interested in the bottom line only, rather than a hockey-weary, hockey-leary woman interested in the bottom line only. The inclusion of the Jack Robinson reference here is truly inspired, since it makes Reggie's tirade come off as something close to homespun wisdom, rather than what it actually is in our terms, in any event, a microaggression against Anita and a hurtful incendiary homophobic slur against her son. Nevertheless, it maintains the dynamic found throughout Slapshot. The women endure and control things where they can, while the men act injudiciously like children and get into more and more trouble. In addition, the veto power remains in play, as Anita can and does end the chiefs, while Reggie realizes that he never really had control over anything. Perhaps, like Hanrahan, he is enraged and frustrated by his own inability to preserve the status quo, and lashes out at others. Reggie was fortunate that Braden chose to strip when he did, because the chiefs might not otherwise have won the Federal League Championship, and he wouldn't have ended up with the coaching gig with the Nighthawks. Going into the championship game, Reggie had no viable strategy to remain in hockey, either as a coach or a player. Though he landed on his feet, he survived by dumb luck. No planning whatsoever went into this. Unlike Francine or Anita, who have plans and make plans, Reggie remains incapable of thinking very far ahead. In this way, he remains a childlike figure, very much like the other men we meet in the course of Slapshot. It's not so much that the women are not also works in progress, it's just that when compared to the men, they are veritable masterminds of planning and seem to function equally well inside or outside traditional relationships. Thank you very much for watching the Slapshot series of videos. Also, I hope that you will consider contributing to support this small but growing channel through one of the donation links found in the description below. Every little bit helps. I would like to extend greetings and deepest appreciation to Lawrence, a viewer who generously contributed to the channel. I am humbled to have such loyal viewers. Thanks so much. I really want this channel to continue on. My goal is more videos more rapidly. Please consider helping the Obsessed with Cinema channel with a donation. Likes and subscribes are also appreciated. As always, I hope you will return to watch other videos. You could sell us. We're hot. People go nuts for us. You could find a buyer. I don't think you understand finance.